Psalm 95, I trust that you found your place there in God's Word, and let's stand together if you're physically able to for the reading of God's Word. We'll read the entire psalm together, all 11 verses. I appreciate that song. And there should be a difference between God's music and everybody else's, shouldn't there? There should be a difference when you hear people talking about God instead of talking about everything else. And I hope that that spoke to your heart. That, that spoke to me. That's what we need, by the way. That's, that's why we come to church to take a time out from us and get all back in tune with Him and give Him what He rightfully deserves. And by the way, as a Christian, that shouldn't just be on a Sunday. That should be every day. Many times during the day, there needs to be a time when we set aside to do that personally with our walk with Him. And I appreciate that song. That was a blessing to me. Psalm 95. Let's read it. Uh, follow along as I read out loud together. God's Word says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Some of you got really excited on joyful noise. You say, I'm not good at singing, but I can make a noise. Make a joyful one, it says. Verse 2, let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and the great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is His also. The sea is His, and He made it, and His hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship the Lord, worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, as, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Let's pray. Father, bless your word. Help me as I preach. Fill me with your spirit and use me. May we each leave here changed more like you is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I don't know if it's about you, but when I was in school, uh, I took a lot of classes, had a lot of lessons. How about you? How many of you, uh, you were in school <laughs> sometime? Now you say, maybe not there mentally, but physically, yeah, I've been through that. And one of the happiest days of my life was when I graduated high school and then I went to college. And the second happiest day of my life was when I graduated with my undergraduate degree. And the third happiest day of my life was when I graduated after taking a master's, a year of master's. And of course, I, let me rephrase that. My first greatest happiest day was salvation. My second was the day I got married. I'm sorry about that. Third, third, fourth, and fifth were when I graduated, okay? And I don't understand these people that want to be full-time students, you know? They say, well, I got a free ride. That's one ride I don't like the destination where it's taken me, okay? So I'll find another ride with that. But I, I took a lot of classes, had a lot of lessons. I had some really good professors and teachers. I had some others that they did their best, and... I didn't do my best in some classes, in some classes I really applied myself and did my best, but the truth is, is that there's been some times when during the course of class after class after class after class, I heard some subject matter more than once. How many of you can testify to that, that there's been things in your life you've heard more than once, and I don't know what it is, the older I get, but the more impatient I get with hearing information I already know. You know, no, 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 get to the new stuff, and let's not recap all of this. Let's, let's get to the new material. Sometime uh, I, I'm at home and my wife wants to tell me uh, a story or something that happened to her today, and women are different than men. Have you noticed that? If you haven't, just hold on, you will. Women are different than men. Men want to know the new stuff. Get to the highlights. Get to, that's what, I mean, that's what highlight reels were for. They were for men. That's why they invented that. We don't care about the whole game. Tell me all the great stuff and the high points and the highlights. And when I'm at home, I just want to hear the big thing. You know, ultimately, I just want to hear, why are you telling me this? And let's get there as fast as we can. And, of course, women are not that way. They want to say, well, I got up this morning. And, oh, okay, I understand. I know that. And I got dressed. And this happened. And, 
And I'm in my mind can, trying to connect the dots. How does this relate to the new information? And many a time, let's hear the husbands in all the room, many a time it doesn't. Right? It just is something that, that you want to be told and it's a story that you had to wait to get to the end. But here's the point of it, is that there's sometimes in life when I've heard the same thing more than once. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, there's been times when you've sat through a sermon preached on a familiar passage of Scripture. I might go around the room. I was, I was brought up in church. I told the Sunday school class this morning, I was like what the preacher says from time to time. I was raised on drugs. I was drugged Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I was in church nine months before I was born. I mean, I was in church, around church, under the church, through the church, above the church. I was, I was everywhere you can be around the church. And if you ask me, how many times have you heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den? I'd say more times than I can remember. David and Goliath. Jonah and... I was waiting for somebody to say the ark. I was teaching junior church one time, and I said, how many of you have heard of, heard of Jonah? And somebody, somebody raised their hand and said, yeah, he built the ark. And I went, oh, man. Let me go back to the beginning. I, I'm glad I chose to, to teach on this story. <laughs> But, but we can go around and I can tell you that. And then there's a tendency from time to time, well, I've heard that before and I've heard a message on that before and I've taught lessons on that before. There's a tendency that when we hear things that we've heard before, we sort of go into sleep mode. Let me coast through this till something grabs my attention. But there are some times when I've been listening and I didn't catch all the information. And I've had to raise my hand and say, excuse me, <laughs> will you repeat that? Can you tell me that one more time? And hear me, more often than I've raised my hand and said, will you repeat that to me? I've had a good, very good teacher who understood I needed to hear it again, and they repeated it anyway. It's been said that repetition is the mother of all learning. It means if you want to learn something, you do it over and over and over, as a parent, I, sometimes I want to pull my brains out, you know, and because I say, how many times do I have to tell you boys to do this? And a light bulb goes ding, and I remember, hey, apparently one more time. <laughs> Why? Because they haven't quite got a grasp on it. They haven't quite learned it. Why? Repetition is the mother of learning. And excuse me, you might feel like you're saying it to a wall, but one of these days, it's finally going to sink in. When we get to Psalm 95 in our text, this psalm is really one within a group within a group of the psalms known as theocratic psalms or the coronation psalms. And what's the importance of that? The importance of that is that these were written or adapted for the usage specifically in the dedication of the second temple in Jerusalem. So when they were dedicating the second temple, this is after the captivity has been over with, they're let to go home, and under Zerubbabel and Ezra, there's a great revival of worship to God, and they get back to Jerusalem, they rebuild the temple of God, and during that dedication of this second temple, the second dwelling place of God among men, what do they do? They recite, or they read, Psalm 95. You have to remember that in the history of Israel, this is after the overthrow, overthrow, overthrow of the Babylonian Empire and the regathering of Israel by marvelous events of God through history. God leading nations and moving kings of the known world to get a small group of Jewish people back to their homeland and allow them to travel back and begin to rebuild their temple and then to dedicate that temple once again to God. In fact, if you're taking notes in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7, this psalm is quoted in the book of Hebrews. And it's really important to note here that David is noted in Hebrews as the author of this psalm. And I always think it's interesting to note that because David never saw the temple built. He never had the joy and the privilege of entering into what he referred to as the house of God. What, remember uh, Psalm 23? And I will dwell in what? The house of the Lord forever. David never got to see the house of the Lord. Not the one he wanted to build. It just goes to show you, you don't have to be in a building to be in the presence of God. David said, I want to live there all the days of my life. And you don't have to come to a building with a steeple or a cross on it to be in the presence of God all the days of your life. 
He can live in his presence each and every day. In fact, that's what we need to do. That's what we should do. But when we get to Psalm 95, when we're looking at this, just like the teachers that I had in school that said, hey, I'm going to repeat this. I know this is review for you, but let me remind you of some things. It seems as if this psalm reminds us of some things that, that, that need to be repeated in our lives. And I'm going to share them with you this morning. I want to give you two declarations that are worth repeating. Two declarations from this psalm that are worth repeating. And in just a second, we're going to notice here that this psalm is really broken into two sections. Really easily, these 11 verses can be broken into two sections. But I'm going to deal with the first one. And here it is. The first declaration is we should worship God. Whoa, wait a second, Brother Doug. I know that. <laughs> Heard that one before. I don't want to pop your bubble, but everything in this sermon you've probably heard before. But it needs to be repeated. And David, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, repeats this morning that we need and we should worship God. Look at verse 1 of, of Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. We should worship God. God is worthy of worship. God is, is delighted when we worship Him. God expects and desires that we worship Him. Why should we, though? You ever just been told, oh, you need to worship God? Come to, come to church. We're going to worship God. I had a guy on soul winning one time years ago in North Carolina. I said, we'd love to have you visit. Man, he was antagonistic. He cursed at us. He said, what are you doing coming here and pushing what you think on other people? And if I want to come to your church, I'll come to it. I don't need you pushing this down my throat. And all I did was say, we're from such and such Baptist church. And that started in on me. And I remember that he was being very antagonistic. I had a young teenager with me at the time, and what I said is, okay, you know what? We're not getting anywhere with this guy. I don't want to furi uh, further infuriate this man. So I said, I'm sorry. We didn't, need to bother. we didn't mean to bother you. We're just inviting folks to church. He began to continue to rant and rail at us. I'm walking down his driveway. I mean, I'm getting a good way away from his house. He's still yelling and coming out on the porch. And I mean, I thought he's going to walk down the, the sidewalk with us, telling everybody he knew you know, what kind of rascals that we were. But I remember that I turned around just being polite, trying to leave an open door for next time. I turned around and said, hey, we, we just love to have you visit. And he said, why on earth would I go to your church? And I said this, well, to worship the Lord with us there. And this is what he replied. Why? Is he there? I say, what did you say? Have a good day, dirty, rotten scoundrel. I said, did you really say that? No, I didn't say it. I wanted to say it. If my wife was there, I'd let her say it. No, I but you see what happens there is sometimes we say that, come worship the Lord with us there. What do you do? Hey, do you have a place where you worship God? What do we mean by that? And more importantly, why? Well, that's what you do. That's not a very good answer. Why do you worship him? I'm glad David gives us some very good reasons. In verse number one, what does he say? We need to worship God because he keeps his word. Whoa, wait a second. Let's read that verse again. It didn't say anything about his word. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. I didn't hear anything about the word in there, Brother Doug. Well, I want to tell you that this title of the Lord is actually the name Jehovah God, which means the God of covenant, the God of promise, the God who keeps his word. So by very definition, when they said, oh, come, let us rejoice and sing unto the Lord, they were saying by using that specific name and title for God, let's praise God. Why? Because he's the God who keeps his word. Why were they using this in the second dedication of the temple? It's because they'd just gone through 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Now they were being released to go home by the Medo-Persian Empire. They were allowed to go back and to reclaim and begin to rebuild their land that had previously been destroyed and annihilated by invasion and by captivity. And so when they come to the dedication of the temple, they find this Psalm of David using this title of Jehovah God, the Lord. And what they are doing is they are reminding themselves God is worthy of worship. Why? Because he always keeps his word. And I want to tell you that that's exactly what God did. Can I remind you that by prophecy, they were only going to go through 70 years of captivity. And can I remind you emphatically, that's all they went through. God said 70, and on the 70th year, it was over. That's a, that's a pretty interesting coincidence. No, that's God keeping his word. God said 
You're going to go back and you're going to begin to reclaim and to rebuild. And what happened? That happened exactly the way he declared. He said that a king by the name of Cyrus was going to decree and he was going to send them back. And guess what? Exactly the way he declared it happened exactly that way. Cyrus the king made a declaration unbeknownst to him, but God had foretold it years and decades earlier. I'm going to tell you that we have a reason to worship God today. It's because God always keeps his word. Well, not to me. I challenge that according to Scripture. I challenge that by the track record of God, who emphatically says countless times in Scripture, prove me, try me, see if what I say is not so. God is not afraid of you to test him. <laughs> God wants you to. He wants you to find him faithful because he is. That's who he is. That's what he does. He's not afraid of you asking him, God, do this for me. God, is this really what you want? God, make yourself known. God has no problem doing that. In fact, that's his desire. He wants to be made known. When you get to this psalm, why should we worship God? Because he always keeps his word. But also this, he keeps us safe. And I'll tell you that these Jews who rebuilt the temple, they understood one important thing. God preserved them to that day. Well, why didn't Babylon come in and just wipe all of them out? They absolutely could have, but they didn't. Why? God always has a people. He always has a remnant. He always keeps those that are His safe. So, whoa, 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 what about those who died in all of that? Well, here's the truth. They all didn't die. They all didn't perish. They all didn't stay in Babylon and in Persia. God said there will be some that come back, and the ones that were there at the dedication at that temple, they praised and worshiped God. Why? He's a God that kept his word. They were standing back in the promised land, in Jerusalem. He's a God who keeps his word, and he's a God who kept them safe up until this day. Listen, the fact that you're sitting where you're sitting today, breathing good old California polluted oxygen right now, is the fact that God has kept you safe. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, I got problems I deal with. Well, at least you're alive to deal with them. At least you have a brain and faculties about you to understand that you have issues that you need to work on and that you need to come to the house of God and you need to gather yourself around God's word. And God wants to remind all of us today, he always keeps his word and he's keeping us safe. Don't get all bent out of shape about the government and, oh, what if this happens? And, oh, what if that happens? And, oh my, what are we going to do if gas goes up? And, what are we going to do if this happens? And, what if all our technology goes by the wayside? And, oh, what if, what if so-and-so becomes president? And, oh, what about this? And, what about that? Hey, as a child of God, let me encourage you. God will keep you safe. Yes, yes, amen. God will keep us safe. God will keep us. That's the emphasis. He'll keep us. He's promised to do that. But notice the third thing in here. Look at verse number two. Let us come before his presence. Can I tell you that God invites us into his presence? Why should we worship? Because God invites us to come into his presence. You know I'm saying? God's holy. We're not. God is righteous. We're not. Let's, let's get more basic than that, humanly speaking. God is royalty. <laughs> I'm not. You think you're waltzing in the Buckingham Palace? Hey, where's Queenie at? <laughs> I just want to sit down and have a cup of tea with Her Majesty, you know? Are you going to do that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Those red stiff shirt guys, <laughs> they're going to come out and escort you away and you have some nice pictures and stories to talk about. God is royalty, I'm not. But what does he do to take care of all that? He invites us into his presence. Yeah, listen, as a Christian, don't lose sight of that. What an immense privilege that is. God invites us to come. Listen, I'm glad I serve a God who gives an open invitation. But it's only his way. It's not your way. You don't come your way. But what does he say? Come. And you come his way. Look at verse 2. It's a place of praise. Notice what it says. We need to approach Him gratefully. He says, with thanksgiving. Are you thankful that you get to worship God? I'm talking about this morning with the wheat that you've had and the 
morning that you've had getting to rest. I'm not not talking about do you feel like worshiping God today. It goes beyond feeling. It moves into fact. I want to tell you, when you think about a God that always keeps his word and has kept you safe and has always done right by you, even if you didn't always understand those things, the songs that we sang today were deliberate. A lot of those songs talks about praising God for who he is, not just what he does and how we like it and prefer it to be. But when we truly see God for who he is and we realize he invites us to come into his presence, you know what that's going to generate? That's going to get generated a heart full of thanksgiving and being grateful to God. Listen, you're going to be less likely to criticize when you're grateful. Uh, my boys, six, four, and two, you know how I know when they're selfish? When they're not grateful. Listen, thank you has to be taught to all of us. As an adult, some of us, it would break our jaw to still say thank you to somebody. I know adults, it's like they would have a heart attack before they say thank you to somebody, like a waitress bringing their food to them. That's what I'm paying them for. That's ridiculous. But hear me, there's Christians that that God has redeemed their eternal undying soul from an ever-burning judgmental hell, and what do they do? They still don't have time to be grateful to God for anything. Man, man, Sunday's my only day off. Well, you better be grateful God gave you one. And it just so happens to correspond with the day that he gives you opportunity to be in his house and to worship him. But what happens, some people... Don't have time for that. Are you thankful? We we are so easy to criticize things that God has gifted us with. People criticize a church instead of being grateful. You know, grateful that God established his work in a city like Long Beach and more than one. We need to be grateful for that. If you're a part of this local church, that's something we need to be grateful about. We have a pastor that loves and prays and prepares God's word to give us faithfully. That's something we need to be grateful about. I didn't like that sermon. Fooey on it. Be grateful. Listen, I wish I always had ice cream, but sometimes you got to eat peas. But at least somebody was good enough to serve them both to you. You need to be grateful. But what's going to generate that? Not a view on the things, but a view on the one who gave them to you, a view on God. You know why I think a lot of Christians are ungrateful today? Their view of God's not what it ought to be. Okay. Oh, I love the Lord. I love the Lord, but I can't stand brother so and so in the choir. <laughs> no, you're not grateful. I love our church, but if we just got a new pastor, everything would be different. Yeah, you better believe it'd be different. Nobody's the same. But you're ungrateful. Well, if I just got a new wife, my life would be so much better. She might be saying the same thing about you. So you better be grateful she's still around for you to fuss with. Man, God's blinded every woman in here who's a wife. At least he did up until the two magic words that knocked her out of it. I do. What happened? I don't know, but isn't it wonderful? (laughs) I tell you, we need to be people who are grateful. If we worship God, it needs to be gratefully. Here's the second thing, though. We need to approach God gladly. What does he say? Make a joyful noise. Listen, you can't work that out. No praise band can make you joyful. Joy comes from within and flows without. You can't work that up, buddy. Joy comes from being right with God. That's why joy can last through all the seasons of life, not just when you feel good. Hey, you don't believe me? Let's get a praise band in here and clap it up. And while we're all in here clapping it up, I'm going to pay somebody $150 to go through the entire parking lot and key everybody's car in here. And when we all go outside, I want to see how many people still have joy. Some of you are going to get up right now and go check and see if that's going on right now. You're going to say, bless God, it isn't important enough. I'm going to go check on my Cadillac. I'm just telling you, joy is something that comes from obedience to God. You can't work that up. That comes as a byproduct of having God where he needs to be and you obeying him like you should. And then God says, when you do that, you're going to have joy. What's he say? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's not only a place of praise, it's a place of privilege. Look, If you read through verses 3 through 5, it's going to say, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth, the strength of the hills, is his also, the sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. I think it's just a great reminder that God made everything, physical and spiritual, God created it all. And when we come into the presence of God, it's a place of praise, but it's a place of privilege. God who created all things, 
doesn't desire birds being his presence or fish or fowl or deer and all these things that he created and that he made. He only invites one thing to come into his presence. What is that? Man. Man. What's the one thing that hurts God the most? Wrongs him, sins against him, rebels, defiles himself. Man. And when we come into the presence of God, we need to understand it is an awesome privilege to be in God's presence. That's why we don't come to church smacking gum and taking it lightly. Man, man when, you, when this thing going to be over with? I'll tell you what, you're not in the presence of God. You don't have to tell people you're not. People, listen, God knows who's serious about Him. It's a place of privilege. It's also a place of power. He made everything. Yet He still invites us into His presence. But very quickly, I want to share really something that I believe is sobering. But let me ask you a couple of questions. The truth is, is that there's no limit to the reach and realm of God's power and might. That's really the emphasis there when it says, hey, all these dark places... God knows about them. The seas, God made them. Listen, all the deep secret things that are going on in all of our lives, God understands that. And His reach is not hindered to reach even to the deepest, darkest places of the earth. Don't you think for one minute God is negligent to know what's going on in your life. You just need to trust Him and praise Him. Do you realize what it started with that? It didn't start with primarily worship. It started out with praise. Thanksgiving. Hey, you want your life to turn a little bit differently tomorrow because you were at church today? Then I challenge you, between now and Monday morning, make some time and just thank God for some things. No, no, no. No prayer request. Just thank Him for stuff. Well, what if I forget? Start guessing. And then start thinking of who He is and thank Him for who He is, not just what you get from being around Him. I guarantee you Monday will be a little bit different than how it normally is if we took the time just to thank Him. Is there a need that seems way too big in your life? In our mind, you've got an awesome, powerful God. And He invites you into His presence. But verse number 7 is really important. He says, for He is our God and we are the people of His pasture. Here's the third thing about His presence is He invites us into a personal relationship. Because God just doesn't want a rally club. You know what I'm saying? God doesn't want a fan base. God's in town. woo Paparazzi. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm going to wear my Jesus t-shirt and wear all my Christian stuff. I'm going to buy pictures and put it on my wall and posters that have Bible verses. I mean, let's be honest. There's some Christians who are basically just fans of God. I'm going to buy all the Christian stuff and say the lingo, and this is awesome, man. God is coming to town. God is part of our church, and he came by. Woo! But God said, I want it to be a little bit deeper than that. I want you to have a personal relationship with me. What does he say there? He said, for he is our God, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Man, God promised he'd take us through captivity, and he did. Why? Because he's a good God. He's the greatest king there ever is, and he takes care of his own, and he has guided us. Why? Listen, I'll tell you what. We're not just going to follow him like we did the king of Israel. We're going to follow him because he's our God. And I encourage us all today, we need to get a glimpse of our God. I mean, there's a time when this building should fade away, and the deacons fade away, and our pastor loves us fades away, and our family who wants to serve God fades away. I'm going to tell you what, there's going to be a day when all you're going to have is you and your God. Teenagers, let me encourage you. Your mom and dad's God is not going to be your God. You've got to make him your own God. Listen I'm, th I, listen, I'm thankful there's a day that I can look back to when I, didn't, when I stopped talking about mommy and daddy's God and started talking about God that did things in my life for me and for my family. I'm nobody special. I'm just saying... I thank God for times when I started having my own stories to tell about what God had done in my life and I didn't have to rely on my pastor's stories or my mom and dad's stories or people of the long, long past's stories. But I had some accounts I could tell people personally, let me talk to you about my God. What my God has done. So that when I come into a church service like this one and I hear a song like that about bowing the knee, I'm not thinking about your God and I'm not thinking about mom and dad's God and I'm 
not thinking about Pastor Jones, God. I'm thinking of the God who saved my eternal dying soul from a sinful, burning hell, and he delivered me, and he's changing me. I'm not what I ought to be, but I think, God, I'm not what I used to be. And day by day, as I walk with him, as I follow him, as I read his word, as I do my best to apply it to my life, my God is changing and working and actively involved in my life. And when we come to the house of God on a Sunday, I'm not praising your God. I'm praising my God. And that's why some people don't worship when they come to God's house. Because you're not going to worship somebody else's God for long. You're not going to sing hymns about somebody you, you don't know that well. Listen, you love your wife. I don't love your wife. I love my wife. I'm not going to write a love letter to your wife. I'm not going to sing a song about her. But I'll definitely do some things for mine. And when God is your God, and you realize you're a sheep in his pasture, changes everything. Can I share as quick as I can with you? There's a shift in the psalm. He's reminding us about worship. And man, isn't it important? You just get back to the basics of worshiping God. After all, that's why we're all supposed to be here, isn't it? Not to applaud a choir that sings. Not to sing a hymn. Not to give some in a plate. All those things are great. But we're here to worship our God. And if we leave here without worshiping God, can I tell you, we missed it. We, we missed it. That's why the Bible said you can have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. You've got the shell. It's like on Easter when everybody wants to buy those plastic eggs. And boy, how excited kids are. But if you open up one, it doesn't have any, nothing in it. What is it? It's a dud. There's a lot of people going to church and they've got a shell. They've got a pretty good form. But it's just hollow and nothingness inside. But now there's a shift. Because look at verse number 8. He said, today if ye will hear His voice, verse 8, harden not your heart. Can I tell you secondly that we should heed His warning. First reminder was we need to worship Him. We should worship God, but here's the second reminder. We need to heed His warning. Because originally, when they were talking and dealing with this particular instance, with David was penning these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, he was writing about the instance right after Israel had come out of Exodus. Out of Egyptian bondage. And not long after God had delivered by miraculous means, they are questioning God. They are doubting His faithfulness. And now they had come out of Babylonian captivity, and here's the ringing question, is it going to happen like it did before? Are they going to be very tempted that now that they're delivered and able to have liberty and freedom in the position God had placed them in, are they just as easily and, and just as, as fast, are they going to turn their back on God and go their own way? And this warning sounds like a trumpet. Harden not your heart. Harden it not. Why? Because the truth is in verses 8 and 9, we each have a choice to trust God or not. We, we all make our own choices, and you have a choice to trust God or not. These words in verse number 8, when it says, in the provocation, and that word temptation, these are the actual words Meribah and, and Masa. And the importance of these is if you go back in the story of the book of Exodus, we won't for the sake of time, but, but the Exodus 17 verses 1 through 7 deals with Israel at Rephidim. And they're turning against Moses, their leadership, and, 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 Mo, and Pharaoh's host has been swept away, and God's done all these miraculous things, and now they are, they are in need of water, and they turn out and they rail against Moses. They even want to stone the guy. And what happens? God tells Moses, here's a rock here, I want you to smite it, and out of this rock is going to flow water, and they're going to be saved, and their thirst is going to be quenched. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, Moses walks over with his rod, he smites the rod, and out comes flowing water. But the Bible says that Moses names the place Massa and Meribah because the chiding of the children of Israel and because in the language of Scripture, they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Can you believe that? How can people say, is God even with us or not? When they've been delivered through miraculous means. 
They walked, listen, they, they cleared a sea on dry ground, and now just a little while later, they're saying, is God even with us? Does God even care? And what happened? I can guarantee you, it displeased God. Fast forward, new generation. 40 years they've been wandering in the wilderness. An old generation died off. Now they're at the end of the wilderness wanderings. New location, different place, same situation. In Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13, now, 40 years later, uh, they're, they're crying out at Kadesh against another infuriated Moses. And God tells Moses, here's a rock here. I want you to speak to the rock, and out will flow water. And what happens? Moses is so exasperated by the people, he smites it a second time. And God lets water flow out, but because of Moses' disobedience, he will not lead God's people into the promised land. You say, Brother Doug, what's the big deal? Why didn't he do it? Well, the major deal was that he disobeyed God. Okay, that's the major deal. Now, a lot of preaching says he messed up the typology God intended. Well, no, no, it goes more base than that. The guy disobeyed God. All right? So it's not just that he messed up God's plan. It's the fact he didn't do what God told him to do. And you're not going to stay where God has placed you for long if you disobey Him. Reminds me of Saul. Had favor with God. But what did he do? Well, circumstances demand, I'm going to offer this. I mean, by the way, I've waited on the prophet long enough. And as soon as he got done doing that, buddy, the prophet came on the scene and what did he tell him? God has rejected you. Why? He disobeyed God. Now they want to, now they want to get rid of Moses. And you understand this, that at that same place when the water came out a second time, they named the place the exact same thing. He named it Meribah. Why? Because the children of Israel strove with the Lord. They fought with God. They did not believe Him. They did not trust Him. And I want to tell you today that Israel made the choice to follow God out of Egypt, but they failed to trust God in the wilderness. Oh, they trusted Him for deliverance, but they couldn't trust Him for their daily dependence. And doesn't that remind you of a lot of us sometimes as Christians? No problem trusting God to take us uh, and to keep us safe from a, from a burning hell, but buddy, it's different when the bill is due and we don't have enough money to pay it. It's different when the kids are sick or when I'm dealing with a circumstance that seems way outside of my control. Oh, it's so much different then, but I want to tell you, the same God you trust in salvation has designed this Christian life, not that you trust Him less and less, but that you always trust Him more and more. So it's just the basic at salvation. That's why they say childlike faith. <laughs> when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. God's waiting for a lot of us just to grow up in our faith. That's childlike faith. Hey, and that's all you need for salvation. But God says, trust me more. That's just the beginning. I want you to understand in verse number 10 that hardness halts God's working in our life. Look at verse 10. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. Can I tell you that Israel developed a chronic lifestyle of disbelief because of this. They missed out on trusting God in their journey of faith. And can I remind you, all of us that are Christians, we're all on a journey of faith. And it's not just about heaven, the destination. It's about our daily walk with Him. And are you trusting Him today? I didn't ask him, are you trusting him to take you to heaven? Are you trusting him today and what you've got today to deal with? When you leave here, you're going to run into something in your life. Monday, this week at work, you're going to run into some things and you're going to need to trust God. And here's the question, are you or are you not? What displeased God? They failed to trust him. Oh, he could deliver us from Egyptian bondage, but we're going to die of thirst out here because God's left us high and dry. You answer this for me, church. Did God take him out in the wilderness to let him die of thirst? How ridiculous. But can I tell you, I failed to trust God in some just as ridiculous situations in my life. Truth be told, I think you could say the same thing. Very quickly in verses 9 and 10, you're going to see that God desired that they move beyond just knowing His works to knowing His ways. And that takes intimacy. Before I got married, when I was dating my wife, I knew her works. And when she showed up, I'd go, woo! Awesome. Her hair looked good. Her makeup was... I didn't even, th you know, I didn't even know she had makeup. It was so awesome, you know? So what, I love her now without it. 
It doesn't matter. What do some preachers say? It's war paint. <laughs> but I love it. Listen, her works, things she would say, the thoughts that she had, but can I tell you, when we became husband and wife, I began to learn her ways. <laughs> And see, you say, well, I know your wife. She likes this, and her favorite thing is that, and this, and this, and this. Can I tell you, all those things you've seen from the outside in, those are the works. But when you get in a deeper relationship, you know the ways, and those are from the inside out. And do you hear what God said? I wanted it to go beyond that they know I can make a Red Sea part and make water turn to blood. But I want them to know my ways. I want them to know me, not the stuff I do. I want them to know me. Look at verse number 10. If you, if you underline things, underline this please. Hardness grieves the heart of God. Did you see that in verse 10? I grieved with this generation. You understand something as a Christian. The choices we make can grieve the heart of God. The stuff you choose to do grieves Him. Just like a father grieving over the choices of their children away from Him. But here's another thing. Look at the latter part of verse 10. Hardness guides us wrong every time. The Bible says here that people that do err in their heart. Oh, you can choose to go your own way and not to do things God's way, but what's going to happen? Every time you choose that, it's going to lead you wrong. Every time. It will lead you wrong. Can I close with this? Look at verse number 8, if you would, please. I've got this, these two words underlined in verse number 8. The Bible says, as in the day. Underline the day. And then the very next verse, I have underlined 40 years long. And I've got a line drawn from the day to the expression 40 years long. And if you don't get anything out of this, get this true and plain this morning. Nobody sets out to live a lifetime with a hard heart. Right. Nobody. It's just a day. It's just a choice. One time, one event, one opportunity that they tell God no. They begin to harden their heart. And before you know it, 40 years is gone. I may be talking to some people in this very room today who've lived a lifetime with a hardened heart and you could trace it back to one time when you told God no. I want to tell you and encourage some of you today that you are on the verge of creating a lifestyle of a hardened heart. I'm talking to some teenagers who you are deciding today to live your whole life away from God. No, I'm not. I, I, this is just this one service. This is just one sermon. Oh, no, friend. It goes beyond that because once you do it once, it's a little bit easier to do it the next time. Once you say no, it's a little bit easier to say no again and no again, and he'll leave you alone. And buddy, before you know it, 40 years is gone. And you've lived with a hardened heart, and people's lives are full of regret and pain and suffering and heartache, and it's because one day... They decided against God. And they turned around and 40 years is gone. I want to encourage you today. That's why he says, today, if ye hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today, if you hear it, harden it not. Because today turns into tomorrow. And tomorrow can turn into 40 years. Today, if you hear it, Respond the right way. Today, if you see what he says, walk in obedience to it. You're not guaranteed tomorrow, but I tell you what, you're not guaranteed that if you tell him no, you're going to tell him yes tomorrow either. So what does David say? While you're able, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Hardness brings the judgment of God in verse 11. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. That word rest there, it's also used in Ruth chapter 1. It's to describe the rest found in marriage. Listen, don't think if you're a child of God and you tell Him no and you have a hardened heart, you're going to enjoy everything He's promised that you'll enjoy as a Christian. Because you won't. Judgment will come. 
It'll fall on you. It'll take some good things that God's intended for you far, far away. I close with this principle. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 28 says this, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Notice those two phrases. As ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. And here's the keys. As ye, so will I. And here's the biblical principle. God responds to us how we respond to Him. As ye, so will I. Remember Pharaoh? He hardened his heart. And then the Bible says God hardened his heart. Well, which is it? Did Pharaoh harden his heart or did God harden his heart? Here's the answer. Yes. Because what Pharaoh began, God finished. When he told God no, God made it easier to tell him no. He allowed his heart to be hardened. Listen, a heart is like concrete. If it's not constantly softened, it'll naturally get hard. That's why you need the house of God. That's, hey, that's why I need more than the house of God. I need a daily walk in His Word. Because while you're waiting from Sunday to next Sunday morning, hardening is going on. And you hear David today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Don't be like those people who missed out a whole generation on living in victory and the promises God wanted them. And for what? They chose to harden their heart. And the heart cry of God to you today, if He's speaking to you, don't harden it today. If it's hardened today, ask God to soften it. Here's some closing questions for you. How's your worship? Are you thankful for who God is? Do you come into His presence being grateful? Are, are you glad that you have a God that knows you and He invites you to come into His presence to worship Him? But don't forget about the warning. Beware of allowing your heart to get hardened. Beware of telling God no, of putting things off. If God's speaking to you right now, don't deal with it later. Do it today. Do it now. Do it before that goes away and you allow that heart to get a little bit harder. Some good things to be reminded of in it today.